The film basement is filmed in sunny West Hartford, Connecticut, in front of a live studio Welcome audience. to a solitary episode of The Filmmaker's Basement. I'm Brandon. And I'm the same person. <laughs> just <laughs> less facial hair. <laughs> I just realized there's a different intro I could have gone for with the movie I saw. Yeah. That would have been no. That would have been a little bit of, too much of a rub at you. So I'm gonna <laughs> just skip past that. Um, we're gonna be talking about some of the movies we saw this week, in addition to playing a little game show later on. And the movie I'm talking about um, was the return of Brendan Fraser back mm. to the big screen, and oh. that was the whale. <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been rude. Yeah, that would have been very rude. I, I wasn't going to go with the whale. I was going to say a particularly <laughs> grotesque episode. <laughs> but, <laughs> well, that's still would have been pretty rude. <laughs> <laughs> so, in a town in a town in Idaho, Charlie, a reclusive, unhealthy English teacher, hides out in his flat and eats his way to death. He is desperate to reconnect with his teenage daughter for one last chance at redemption. This movie was really hard to watch, and that's not Ooh. something I get a lot with a lot of movies I see. And it wasn't hard to watch in a bad way. It was a mm. very captivating movie. It was genuinely hard to watch someone eat themselves to death. Mm. Like that, yours, it's not even a very slow decline. It was a very fast decline from where we see Charlie start to where he ends. And it's very visceral. Like it really... It doesn't cut out any, it doesn't leave anything out. You get to see everything as to how this man kind of spends the last week of his life. And it's really hard to watch. Mm -hmm. For me in particular, this gave me a lot of anxiety watching it because this is something I fear in my own life. Like kind of essentially becoming almost like this person. So it was hard for me, but even in general, like it's just, I could not imagine somebody coming out of this movie thinking, like being in a good mood, essentially. Mm. And a lot of that has to do with Brendan Fraser's performance, which, first off, what a return. He did fa a fantastic job playing this, like, this character who really just is, like, really despicable in a lot of ways. I mean, I'll, I'll get into some of those ways in a little bit. And even with all of that, I couldn't help but feel sorry for him. Like, feel sorry for, her, like, all the stuff that's gone wrong in his life, which he caused for the most part. Like, he is his own worst enemy here. And I think that's the theme that comes up throughout a lot of this movie. And, and kind of in that vein, another one of these themes that pops up a lot is that Charlie is like a gross person, but I think it's important to note that that's not really like because of his physical form. And that almost never gets commented on this movie mm. besides from Charlie himself, who sees himself as this vile, despicable person because of how overweight he is. And he sees himself as a slob and this horrible person. No one else in the almost no one else in the movie really comments on that. That's mm. not really ever like a focus as to why they either like think he's gross or why they hate him. Um, and you see this come up a lot. Like his daughter makes a comment on it at one point, saying like, "Yeah, like physically you are a gross person, but that's not why I hate you." His ex-wife also brings this up when she's like, "Oh my god, what have you done to yourself?" Kind of thing because she hasn't seen him in person in a very long time. Because Charlie is somebody who secluded himself away. He only has, like, one friend, essentially, who knows, like, kind of what he looks like. Um, we also see this come up when he's teaching his English classes, because he's a college English professor. He always has his mic off, because he's afraid he will scare his students, mm. and they won't respect him if they see who he is, like, who he actually is. But like I was saying earlier, that's not the reason why he's disgusting. It's because it's the way he acts and who he was before we kind of meet him that make him this really gross person. Like, for instance, like, his drug addict wife hates him because not only did he cheat on her with another man, they stayed in the same town together and kind of abandoned the family she had started with him. Like, mm. abandoned his daughter, which is the reason why she his daughter hates him, because she left him. She didn't, he, he didn't ever really look back as to, like, I'm going to spend time with her, I'm going to, like, fight for her in court to get custody mm -hmm. of her. Nothing. Abandons her, essentially, to run mm -hmm. off with. Uh, his student essentially keep in mind the student's about the same age as him it's not like this is like an 18 year old it was the same age as him um we also see this come up with his like best friend who's a nurse who literally spends most of her time taking care of him and coming to his house because as he puts it he doesn't have any money to go to a real doctor because he's a college professor so she helps him and adds, has this horrible like 
I'm not symbiotic. I can't remember what the phrase is for it, but it's like these two people who are leeching off each other, suffering from an exterior loss. Mm. And he lies straight to his face about straight to her face about a lot of really big things that would have helped her in the long run kind of recover from what happened to her brother, the person he was essentially dating and cheating on his wife with. And then we all see this kind of come up with this rando missionary kid who shows up, who's like trying to use God to save him. And he kind of hates him just because he's gay, which it's, I mean, not very valid, but it's still like, a, it's still, it's not because of his outer self. It's because of his inner self that he's like, this person is disgusting to me. And yet Charlie, for some reason, never really seems to like understand this. And I don't know if that's like a coping mechanism of his where like he's using his exterior form and how disgusting he feels on the outside to kind of hide how he feels about himself on the inside. It's something that I would have to watch the movie again to really figure out. And I'm going to be honest with you, I don't think that's something I could do (laughs) because it's a very, very hard watch. Um, But it it goes kind of show like it's really more so on the inside that counts. And it's interesting that they went the opposite direction for that in this film where it's like, yeah, he's a disgusting person inside. He could have been better. He could have done a lot of things in his life to kind of change the person he was and be better. He could have even been proactive in his own life after he lost um, his husband, essentially, like trying to become a better person. But he never does. He kind of just wallows in his own self-pity. Um, and it's also interesting uncovering like his persona and motivations because there's a lot that's hiding in Charlie as a person that comes up throughout the movie that makes him more interesting to kind of understand and view. Especially because this is somebody who seems like, who's definitely because they are trying to escape their life. They want to die. They do not want to be here anymore. Because like they, they don't have any reason to live anymore. They don't feel like they do. They think, Charlie thinks he's screwed up his life and that it's, he's irrecoverable. He cannot recover from where he is. Like it's, this is, a, this is what it is and there's nothing he can do. Hmm. And it's kind of weird because he never really like shies... It's weird because he never really shies away from the fact that he's like, he is the reason why his life is so bad. Which is strange because he also, it seems like he misses this as part of his like coping mechanism. But like, for instance, one of the more notable things I noticed um, was with the religious angle, with the missionary kid. Because this is something that comes up throughout the film is that there's this, Charlie has this kind of, not I guess adverse reaction to religion. He doesn't, he's not a, he's not a big fan of, especially the local chapters of his Christian church. But he, he never does like the, what's it called? The, the passive thing of kind of going into religion and kind of like, because you see this a lot with people who live like a really horrible life where they'll like become a part of this religious community and think they've redeemed themselves essentially. That anything they've done in the past is forgiven and that they're a better person now. And there's, they don't need to, you know, do any more to prove that. And Charlie never really does this, which I thought was a very interesting angle to take. He never really uses his religion as an excuse. If anything, he actually uses it he kind of uses it almost justifiably as a reason why his boyfriend, his husband slash boyfriend isn't around anymore, which is something that comes up throughout the movie. And it kind of is legitimate because it is really a reason why he isn't here anymore and kind of why Charlie is trying to die. Cause again, he doesn't have that reason to keep going. Um, so again, Brendan Fraser was fantastic in this role. Like he really did an amazing job of just making me not again, making me care about this person who is very despicable. Like, that is a very hard task to give to someone. And he did a very good job of that. Mm-hmm. Um, I'll say, I really liked how this was... I really liked how they played with um, the very standard, like, one-room movie. Where everything takes place, essentially, in the same house. Charlie's house. Because he's a shut He doesn't leave ever. Because mm-hmm. he doesn't want anyone... He, for a variety of reasons. Because he doesn't want people to know what he looks like. And also, because he's kind of reached a point where he isn't really mobile anymore. Um, but I loved how like much history there was to this apartment and it's not something you pick up on immediately it's definitely something that comes more revealed as the movie goes on and i bet there's even stuff i would pick up on now if i were to watch it again um but some examples of this are there's this poem that charlie reads to himself to kind of calm himself down like when he is having like a moment or like when you can he can tell like he's like really struggling to like keep going there's this poem he reads to himself that like calms him down, but we don't really know why that calms him down. We don't really know what this, where this poem came from, who wrote this poem. 
it's kind of just up in the air and there's there's some hints here and there but it's it's one of those like interesting little pieces where it's like am i going to get an answer to this or is this just an artifact of charlie's long long gone life um another example of this is the bedroom he used to share with his boyfriend slash husband um charlie's kind of kept it like it's like how you would like if a kid died where it's like you keep the room like as it was because it's hard to take that thing apart it's hard to let go of that memory but it's been so long that like you know it's it's still it's it look the room looks very different from the rest of charlie's house charlie's house well not like messy is cluttered with things Mm -hmm. this room almost seems pristine like it's been cleaned it's been maintained and so at one point, Charlie wants to re- go back to this room. He wants to revisit the, r- the life he used to share with his lover. And when he tries to enter the room, he can't because he is physically too big. And I love that little detail because it's like he, it's like because of what has happened and because of what he's done to himself, he can no longer return to this life that he once had. And it's, again, it's kind of subtle, but it's a really nice note. That Charlie has essentially ruined his life. And it's, again, it's all his fault. And there's no really going back for him. Like, this mentality of, like, he is only going to spiral further and further down is all he has left. Um, It also makes it really hard to ever feel, like, relief in this space. Because you are constantly dealing with Charlie's interactions with all these people in his life. In addition to Charlie just being alone by himself. And you're dealing with his woes. And you're seeing him, again eat himself to death you're seeing him like cry like just suffer in almost in in almost his own personal solitude in this house so it the house almost in itself becomes another person this prison for charlie Hmm. so overall i think it's a very well-made film i love that brendan Fraser's back in acting again because again he did a fantastic job in this movie in addition to everyone else in the cast by the way there's not a bad performance here in particular, his daughter sticks out. Um, she's one of the Stranger Things girls, actually. And yeah. I did not recognize her at all when she showed up in this movie. Because she just feels so different. Mm-hmm. Um, so major props to her. I just couldn't. I didn't. It took me like 10 minutes to figure out that was her. Yeah, she plays Max. <laughs> yeah, she's entirely different. Um, but going back to, again, the synopsis. I, I think you'd have to have a really thick skin to watch this movie. Because it is very, it's, it's very emotionally hard to watch. Mm. It's very, like, raw and real. So if, like, if what I've said so far, as if what I've said so far, like, sparks some interest in you, if you really like character studies, I would give it a shot, but definitely be warned this will not be a comfortable or easy viewing. You are going to have a lot of feelings coming out of this movie. And a lot of, I don't know, it's, it's a lot to process. Hmm. Well, uh, the movie I saw this week uh also took place in one place or one Ooh. house mm-hmm. uh pretty much um it was uh a knock at the cabin oh yeah uh while vacationing a girl and her parents are taken hostage by armed strangers who demand that the family make a choice to avert the apocalypse um this movie was done by m night Shyamalan who is notorious for um, like kind of over the top projects and like twistful, like twisty kind of stories, which I love. We've talked about it a lot on this program that I love twist filled endings. This one was kind of a letdown in that Mm -hmm. aspect. It was a good, it was a good film, Mm -hmm. but when you watch an M night Shyamalan film, you're expecting that penny to drop Mm -hmm. and you're expecting that thing that, you know, is coming. That's going to make, that's going to be a twist, uh, in the end. And it just never came. Hmm. Um, unless, unless the twist had to do with the actual plot of the movie, Mm-hmm. Um, which I won't get into because it'll spoil the movie. Um, that could have been the twist, but that that it there was no like in the vill when you watch the village, you realize which is a terrible movie, uh, but you realize that the village is actually set in modern era, but everyone living in the village is, thinks it's like the eighteen hundreds. So like that's that 
um what was another m night sh- um, i mean old uh in old that came out a few years ago the beach that they were going to was actually a scientific experiment to try to cure diseases so they would force sick people to go to this beach and then basically they would kill them but they would end up creating cures for specific diseases Mm -hmm. so kind of like that kind of penny drop uh kind of suspenseful thriller this one didn't really have something like that um they were basically telling you what was going on the entire movie uh and and you know and so uh other than that um dave batista's great in this huh like really yeah so dave batista's been on record saying he wants to be an actor like he's a he's an ex wwe guy but he wants to be an actor and he kind of threw the rock under the bus by saying the rock was a hollywood star which, rather than an actor which we talked he, about before and i entirely right, agree with <laughs> exactly and he wants to be more like an actor and by god he's he an actor like he's definitely got that kind of essence about him and the the entire movie, there's just these very awkward close-ups mm-hmm. that I don't I don't know if M. Night Shyamalan does, like does this on purpose in like all of his movies, but like the entire first ten minutes of the movie, it's um, Leonard, which is Dave Bautista's character, talking to Gwen, which is the little girl, the little Asian girl's character, and they're talking about like catching grasshoppers and like trying to like become friendly like leonard's trying to become friendly kind of thing and the entire time it's pan it's not panning but it's going back and forth between the two characters and the camera frame is literally like this like it's just zoomed in on their faces the whole time and it's extremely suspenseful um Mm -hmm. because it makes you feel uncomfortable like i'm i was sitting there in my chair and i was like oh this is uncomfortable like him talking to this like little girl and he's just trying to be friendly trying to you know say you know the trying to talking about catching grasshoppers and like oh what's what's your name you know i'm leonard blah 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 um and so but i don't know his performance in this is just be beyond because the this whole premise is like all four of these people have had visions of the apocalypse and they're there to try to stop it from happening and um his performance is so genuine and over the top that um it you believe him like you believe him 100% um and it's just it i guess this is based off of a book which uh i'm going to have to like read it at some point cuz uh, the mm-hmm. book probably is really good um but this portrayal of it was great um there's kind of little twists and turns where like okay maybe these people are lying maybe they're not telling every like speaking the truth about everything and then they start talking and you're just like oh i i think they might be telling the truth like all four of the like strangers that came into um the cabin um their acting performances was were all way over like a hundred percent and it was it's great um the two guys the two the gay couple um they're really good too their chemistry back and forth between each other um you can kind of tell that one of them is kind of being persuaded throughout the whole movie but then Mm. it turns out no he's not and then i don't know it's man it's a thrill ride um keeps you on the edge of your seat it's about an hour and 40 minutes so it's not even really that long so and it doesn't even really feel like it's that long just because it's like one of those movies that has a good pace to it you know it takes place over the course of like two days or something in the movie uh but it's only an hour and 40 minutes there's a couple flashbacks here and there but other than that it's pretty much all takes place in the cabin uh in the woods so Mm -hmm which is another cabin movie. Um, But this was good. If you like a suspenseful kind of thriller, I would go watch it still. It's uh, definitely got 
uh, its pluses and it's got its its pros and cons, if you will. Um, definitely more pros than cons, though. Um, just the, the like I said, the suspense of the actual cinematography mm-hmm. is great. And you can kind of see that from like the trailer, like a lot of the shots in the trailer have like really close ups of, of people's faces. And it's like that the whole movie. If some, if one person is talking, they're talking into the camera. They're talking at like the audience. So it's good. I liked hmm. it. Fair enough. I wonder if it's I wonder if that was intentional. They're not doing a twist thing like M. Night Shyamalan is trying to do. What's it called? Like a, I don't know. an expectation I... reversal. Well, because this was based off a book and mm-hmm. like, I don't remember, I don't remember of any other, um, M. Night Shyamalan movies that were based off of, that were not his own, like, thought up idea mm-hmm. or that were based off books that had like twist endings or whatever. But, um, you know, this, this one, um, I think they stuck, they stuck to the, like the source material heavily except mm-hmm. for the ending. Like the ending in the book is actually different huh. than the ending in the movie. Fair enough. So. Well, interesting to see that he's, you know, doing something a little different from his norm. I would love to see more, see him try to tackle more movies where the gimmick isn't just wait for my twist, you know? Yeah. But that's the thing too, is like it, I say it doesn't really have a twist, but it, it doesn't have that like big heavy twist at the end. Like yeah. that, make, that, that, that M night Shyamalan level twist. I mean, there are there is a twist in the movie. Mm-hmm. It's just um, it's very apparent at the start yeah. of what what it is. Okay. So, well, fair enough, I guess. Interesting to also see M Night Shyamalan coming back. It still feels weird to me that he's like returned to being a director again after being gone for so long. He Even does. though he's he does been, a movie he's once every one every three years, he does a movie. Yeah. I know, he, um, I know he has been back, but it just feels, it feels weird. <laughs> yeah, because, like, I think we talked about it last week, where, like, yeah, mm-hmm. he did, he did old, and then he was doing Glass and Split and, and those movies, but, you know, he, uh, I think the, the only movie before that was After Earth. Well, he, he did a string of really bad movies. Yeah. Uh, the, the three movies straight in a row, The Happening, The Last Airbender, and After Earth. Which like, is probably part of the reason why I think that, because like it's just, they're part just of the forgettable why. movies. Yeah, but I mean, I mean, yeah. I mean, and even the then, six, I think the the movie he the did s- after that with the old couple. Um, I think oh, I the thought visit. He, yeah, the visit. Even that, that was kind of that was a much smaller budget movie, much more. And that wasn't really like, was it not really like a twistful movie? I it yes, really like, it definitely was. It? It was oh, yeah, from what I, I remember, that. that was a they had a big twist at the end. Um, mm. But yeah, just a just a while where he wasn't making good stuff, and then he kind of just made a random return. <laughs> <laughs> but that's just me. What do I know? Okay, moving on. Let's go to everyone's favorite game show segment: um, name pending games. I'm gonna try. I'm gonna. I'm gonna figure out a better name for it, but I think I'm just gonna stick with this for now, just to see what okay. I have. So uh, we're gonna be trying the one that we did last week, which also still needs a name, and I still need to come up with that. But Andrew, I am going to give you three movies that you have seen. Your goal is to guess which movie has the greatest disparity between the critic reviews and the audience reviews on Rotten Tomatoes. Mm-hmm. And in order to do so, I'm gonna give you some of the reviews from these movies. Um, so you have a little bit of it, a little bit of something to base it on. So we're going to start with Uncharted 2022. So the critics said, it's not that much of a movie, but a diversion. It's a big, dumb diversion. The best thing about it is that it serves as evidence that Tom Holland makes for a wonderful movie star. And that was from Amy Nicholson from Film Week. And then the audience review for this one was, such a fun and entertaining movie. Tom Holland is as charming as ever and shows what a bona fide movie star he is. Love the pacing and there's lots of great action, but the writing and plot could have been better. I am hoping they'll make up for that in the sequel. Def recommend. And that's from Patty Flint underscore Flynn. Thank you, Patty. Okay. She the just second. likes Tom Holland. She like, much, she, dude, she loves She Tom doesn't Holland. like the movie. She just likes Tom <laughs> Holland. That's all I got from that review. So number two, we have The Card Counter, one of your favorites, The Critic. Mm. The Card Counter is an uncomfortable, meditative movie about guilt, risk, retribution, and the way America operates. It's also an extraordinary example of Oscar Isaac's power. 
Now that's from Esther Zuckerman from Thrillist. Now we have the audience review. So slow and horribly written, plot lines left many gaps and questions. Oscar's acting, as always, was fabulous, but disappointed in Tiffany's debut in drama. Kept wanting to push fast forward on my remote, but in the theater and did not have one. I really want my money back. You should pay me. And that was from Michelle S. Yeah, the thriller needs to find new writers <laughs> and people to review their movies. So you're definitely more Because Michelle, Michelle S. is on point. <laughs> Okay, and our final one. This was The Adam Project. So the critics said, Ryan Reynolds leads an A-list cast in this Back to the Future nostalgia trip that coasts down well-worn roads instead of paving new ones with fresh imagination. But there is still fun to be to be this cynicism-free throwback to 80s film family entertainment. That was from Peter Travers from ABC News. And then the audience one was, very sense story would have been okay for TV, but to pay to watch it, maybe at a discount price. Main actors were good. Main actors, same old story with him. Just go and play in the same character over and over again. Get old. Rest of cast was nice. That was from Zeke Knight with two T's. Um, okay. So, I, I thought this was a typo. Like, in that, in that one. That's I how need to read that it. again. I need to read that again for the yeah. audience. Very send Very, story I think he would meant have sad. would have been okay for, for TV, TV, but to pay to watch it maybe, maybe at, at a, a discount, discount price. price. So he main would want to pay for it only at a discount. Right, main, main actors, actors were good. Main actors, same old story with him <laughs> just going to playing the same character over and over again. Get old. Rest of the cast was nice. So he doesn't <laughs> like that Ryan Reynolds plays. A similar character, and the rest of the cast was okay. Yeah, my brain hurts. <laughs> that, um, that review actually gave me an idea for another game I'm gonna try out next week. Oh my week. god, <laughs> that one that one was fantastic. Um, okay, so I I've seen the scores for all these, but I don't remember them. The yeah, only yeah. one I do remember is the card counter, mm-hmm. and it was a very wide margin. Mm-hmm. between critic and audience i remember that and that critic and audience is is very similar to that mm-hmm. from from what i remember about the uncharted audience score is it was like a middling score mm-hmm. uh and and the critic score was also not great but it wasn't like awful mm-hmm. and then i don't remember the adam project at all i honestly forgot i watched that movie yeah um but it wasn't as bad as like people say it was so Mm -hmm. that one's definitely three uncharted would be two Mm -hmm. and the card counter is the most disparity okay interesting let's see let's see how you did so on the card counter your number one we had an audience score of 42 percent a critic score of 87 percent with a total disparity of 45 so Mm. pretty wide disparity Mm. all things said let's do uncharted next uncharted had an audience score of 90 percent a critic score of 41 percent for an almost 50 percent disparity between the two Mm. and the last one which surprised me the most um, we had a an audience score of 73%, a critic score of 67%, and an overall disparity of 6%. I did not okay. think that critics so that audience would be that close on that one. Much closer like I thought. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That one's definitely um, close. People, I guess critics just hated Uncharted. I guess so. Which makes <laughs> sense. It's a game. It's I should have known because it's a video game movie. Video games yeah. movie do not do well. No, generally not. Unless you're Sonic, in which case you do middling. Mm. But yeah, the rest of these, not so much. Um, but yeah, I didn't realize how insane a lot of, of uh, Rotten Tomatoes reviews are. So I'm going to be diving into those some more next week for something a little bit different. <laughs> but for now, why don't we look into some of the movies that are coming out in the coming weeks? And I know there's one that you're very excited about, probably. Oh, and in four days, by the looks of things. And on Thursday, it's the last <laughs> movie I get to see on opening weekend on thursdays because mm-hmm. i start my new job mm-hmm. next week fair enough so uh so yeah so yeah, Ant- ant-man next week ant-man and the wasp yep oh, man. the the start of a new saga mm-hmm. well 
no it's the start <laughs> of a new big bad but the start yeah. of a new saga was it's the start of a new phase of marvel which yeah. uh we're in we're in now in the middle of the multiverse saga mm-hmm. so i'm excited to see what what that one's about mm-hmm. um i don't know if there's any other movies that you're interested in talking about that's coming out soon not really i don't i haven't really heard of a lot of these honestly the super bowl was this weekend Mm -hmm. and we got some trailers for some of our like highly anticipated movies of 2023 Mm -hmm. we got trailers for transformers beast war we got uh trailers for guardians of the galaxy volume 3 we got trans trailers for fast x we got oh my gosh i forgot that yeah. i thought they were past 10 already I'm no not gonna no lie. we uh, this is the last one thank oh, god is, oh is this the one where they're going this to space l- i don't know i thought this was, I thought that was coming up and then we got a trailer f- a full trailer for the mm. flash oh, which wow. is the first like james gunn mm-hmm. property for dc that's going to reset the entire dc universe mm-hmm. uh so that's exciting it looks good, and Michael Keaton, Jimmy will, Jimmy will uh, love it. But Michael hmm. Keaton is back as Batman. Ooh. Yeah, Jimmy, big fan over there. Interesting that you they're going starting with the Flash, but I guess well, if you're going to start with anyone, it's just probably no bad the, decision there. That's just the one that's been yeah. it's been made for like the last year and a half. Yeah, it's like they I just, guess they just kept go. pushing it back. Yeah. Yeah, I'm trying to think. The only thing that like seems remotely interesting is probably just Cocaine Bear, just because that's you know, that's just gonna be stupid. I'll probably hate it, but mm-hmm. it seems like it'll be weird as heck. And I'm sure there'll yeah. be better stuff coming out in March. Ray, but... Ray Liotta's final movie. Oh my god, I keep forgetting that's a thing. Yeah. I can't believe it's Cocaine Bear. His last movie's Cocaine Bear. Oh, that's such a letdown, man. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Rest in peace, Ray Liotta. I can't believe it had to be Cocaine Bear. <laughs> okay well uh we can we can close that out on that note then um andrew do you have anything you want to plug this week oh um i want to plug um jimmy actually his film police three actually got accepted into a film festival i believe it's the gi film festival in san diego in san diego yeah um i gotta check on that real quick just to see when that one's viewing but i believe it's sometime in may or april right uh may may yeah mid may, mid may yeah, it looks like May 15th. So if you're in the San Diego it's, area, check it out. It's going to be it's a really good movie. It's a 5-day event and mm-hmm. so we don't know the schedule yet of when, yeah. what day it's going to get shown. So And we'll we'll, we'll update us. Keep an eye out for that uh later. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. But besides that, I think I am all good, so we'll call it quits there. Thank you everyone for listening to Filmmaker's Basement. I'm Brandon. I'm beardless. <laughs> full of shame yeah i think and we will see y'all next time thank you for listening